the last six kings of Rome after Romulus. During the reign of Romulus, Romulus had briefly shared role with a Sabine king named Titus Tatius, or Titus Tatius. And Titus Tatius had soon died, and the Sabines therefore had felt cut out of power that they thought they deserved when they had moved to Rome following the rape of the Sabines and the Tarpeia incident. The Sabines, therefore, wishing to regain some measure of power, insisted that when Romulus himself eventually died or ascended to heaven, that the Romans pick a king from among their own nationality. The Romans agreed to this on one condition, namely that they, the Romans, would get to choose who. In the end, they picked a person named Numa Pompilius, who is very well known and regarded as one of the most pious of the Sabines. He had been a court official, but had clearly not been seeking personal power because he had returned to his farm after his work had been done instead of seeking higher offices. Numa Pompilius, when he heard that he had been chosen, the first thing he did was he consulted the gods and asked whether they were disposed to it or whether the signs were instead against it. And finding that they were in favor of his kingship, accepted and returned to Rome and became the second king of Rome. Numa's greatest contribution to the Romans was the founding of the eight priesthoods of Rome. The first priesthood was the Curiones, who were priests one for each Curia, of which there were 30 to divide up the whole Roman population. Curia is kind of like a council, so there were basically 30 tribes, and each one had a Curio as its priest. The second group of priests that Numa founded were the Flamines. This is a picture of a Flamen, or some describe this as a picture of a Flamen. So I'm not sure whether they had a little right lightning rod on their hats. But there was one Flamen for each of the major divinities. And that Flamen's duty was to see to it that that deity was worshipped properly. And so they would probably be attached to the temple of that particular deity throughout Rome. Besides the Flamines, there were the Vestals, which Numa transferred from Alba Longa. And so here's a picture of a Vestal Virgin, whose duty it was to tend the sacred hearth fires of Vesta, or in Greek, Hestia. The th fourth one was the Kellerates, which I cannot find any information on. But the fifth was the Augurs. And here is an augur with his little wand and a bird eating at the bottom, because the augur's job was to observe the flight of birds and tell the future based on what bird flew from what quadrant of the sky to what other quadrant of the sky, and also how many and um, who, which deities' birds they were and things like that. Numa also established a priesthood of Mars called the Salii. Now the word Salii comes from the word to leap, like in the word assault or somersault or to sally forth. <laughs> Here you'd see two Salii priests, and they would leap and do this dance through the streets, which was supposed to sim simulate combat, which in ancient times involved a large amount of leaping to both avoid spear strokes and to give spear strokes. Now you can see that they're carrying a stick from which there are these shields hanging. And the story of those is that one of these shields was a shield not made by human hands, but which had fallen miraculously from heaven as a sign of Jupiter's, um, or maybe it was Mars's, I don't remember, divine protection for the city. And rather than let that shield alone possibly get vandalized or stolen, the Romans came up with a plan, and that was that they made copies of it, so that there were really seven or eight shields. So nobody knew which one was the actual one. So the Salii would carry all the shields through Rome, and you just had to trust that one of them happened to be the real one that had fallen from heaven as a sign of divine protection. Numa also established the order of the Fetiales, and this, some say that this is a picture of the, of the Fetiales. The Fetiales' job was, from the word fetiol means faith, 
they were to preserve faith and see to it that right acting and fidelity was upheld at, at all times. And their main job was to see that faith was preserved in the declaring of war. So a fetiel would go to another district and his job was to declare war on behalf of Rome against some other place. And if the, the ultimatums that Rome had demanded were not responded to, then they would declare war. But if they were responded to, then they would return word that the other place had accepted their demands. And then the last priesthood begun by Numa were the pontiffs. Now, the pontiffs were kind of like the chief priests. They were a college of like five or six priests. And the chief one was called the Pontifex Maximus. So here we see a picture of the Emperor Augustus as Pontifex Maximus. Eventually, the priesthood came to be synonymous with the emperor. And why? Because the pontiff's job was really the main public work of religion. So pontiffs were really the main priests of Rome. They were to do atonement or expiatory sacrifices in the event of disasters. They were to consecrate temples. They were to regulate the calendar. At the calends, the first of each month, they would call out the new month so that everyone knew, it, knew that it was a new month. And they would also have to determine when that month would be, which was complex since months didn't quite work out in ancient times. And then they presided over funerals and marriages and wills when someone had died and the public morals. So that was the pontiffs. And the chief one, of course, would be the Pontifex Maximus. Next thing that Numa did was he built the Temple of Janus, or Janus, in the form, which you can see here pictured on a coin. It was a very small, square, cubic little building, and it had doors at both ends. And the story is that in peacetime, the doors were shut, but at time of war, the doors would be left open to symbolize that Janus had gone out to defend the Roman army out in the field. And you can see a picture of the Temple of Janus here, right there. It's a tiny little building in front of the present day Curia Julia, which is where the Senate would meet. That's the Senate House. So um, obviously the building is gone at this time. It no longer exists. But in any case, that's where it was. So Janus is a two-faced god. He had two faces pointing opposite directions. And so he was kind of like the new year, which looks both forward like a little baby to the new year, which is young, and backward like an old man to the old year, which is old. And so he was the two-faced god of the new year, hence January, and the god of doorways, who would look both inward and outward at the same time. Okay, so who was this Numa Pompilius? The theory was, is that he was probably a Pythagorean, which was a class of philosophers following Pythagoras. In southern Italy. Their big belief was that the whole world is composed of numbers and quantities. And so they would conjecture that the planets going around in those circular orbits up in the heavens were, were spaced out at particular intervals and were making music just the way a larger diameter musical instrument will make a lower pitch than a smaller diameter musical instrument. So they were really big into rationalizing and doing a lot of good fractional math. And therefore, Numa was not very mythological. He was very just cerebral and rational. And so he forbade images, usually Traditionally, in ancient cultures, there would be a cult statue inside every temple, but Numa got rid of them. So basically, Numa was the first iconoclast, which means image destroyer. And as with most iconoclasts, the reason that they don't like images is because they think that the image is an insufficient representation of the god. It doesn't mean they don't believe in gods. It just means that they think that the god is so much greater than that, a pure spirit, that the image can't do it justice. Other iconoclasts in history were in the Byzantine Empire and also Muslims and Calvinists to this day. Churches like the Baptist and the Presbyterian don't have images, don't have statues inside for the same reasons. The next king of Rome was Tullus Hostilius. Now, if you remember, 
Numa was a Sabine, so now it swings back to having a Roman, and we'll see it, see it swing to being a Sabine again in the next king. But here, Tullus Hostilius was a son of Romulus, and he was very warlike, as his hostile name sounds, and he was not pious, unlike Numa, so he wasn't into religion. Um, and the result of that was you can see that he was ultimately killed by, struck down by lightning. He tried to do a sacrifice and didn't do it correctly. And so in ancient times, you had to do a sacrifice perfectly. And if you didn't, then it was a disaster and you had to start over. Well, <laughs> Tullus Hostilius did it wrongly and was zapped by lightning, and that was the end of him. But before that happened, he was waged a lot of wars quite successfully, I might add. Um, one of his wars was with Alba Longa. And the Romans and the Albalongans decided that they didn't want to lose a lot of soldiers, so they reduced it to a contest and said, okay, we'll both put forward three groups of twins. Actually, not twins, but triplets. And whichever one wins, we'll get to dictate the terms of the peace treaty. So if we win, we will get to rule over you all, and if you win, you'll get to rule over us. And the Romans put forward a group of three men named the Horatii, our word Horus. And you can see them here receiving their weapons. And the Albalongans put forward a group of three called the Curiatii. And the story is that the three Curiatii killed two of the Horatii, so that only one was left. But that one was smart. And so instead of standing and fighting and getting killed also, he was fast, and he went running away. And the three Curiatii went chasing him, and as they chased him, they got strung out, separated from each other, far apart, so that the last Horatius then was able to lie hidden and kill each one of them one by one um, without the others around. And that was why... Rome got to dictate the peace treaty and impose terms on Alba Longa. Well, Alba Longa broke the treaty ten years later, and so along came Tullus Hostilius and basically ransacked Alba Longa and relocated the whole population to Rome's Hylian Hill. The five, hills of, five main hills of Rome form a cross or an X, the Kylian is the one on the right. Closest to, to Alba Longa. Um, Quirinal way up here is the one closest to the Sabines, where the Sabines settled, so that might help you remember that, too. Hostilius also gave his name to the new Senate house that he built, called the Curia Hostilia, and here you can see a picture of it. It's a little square building here with a large courtyard, and in the courtyard was the rostra, which was the speaker's platform. And, oh, and you can see that same image here, how it would fit. The black, Curia Julia, is the present-day Senate House, built by Julius Caesar, which survives to this day. You can see it there. But the red here is where the Curia Hostilia would have been in ancient times. Another map of it is this one, which supposes that the courtyard was a round one, with a roster there. But who knows? So in any case, you can go to Rome and see the modern Senate House, which is now a church, but the old one was removed. That was the third king, Tullus Hostilius, the Roman son of Romulus. He had been so impious that it seemed a good time to bring back another pious Sabine. So they brought forward a son of Numa, who was Ancus Marcius. He didn't do much, but he did war with the Latins and settled them on the Aventine Hill, down here at the south end of things. Which is the hill closest to them. And the only other thing that Ancus Marcius did is, if you go to this web address, which I'm about to do, which is a great example of Rome's water resources, I clicked 630 BC here, and you can see that he built the first bridge across the Tiber. Before that, there had been this ferry running, but here the Pons Sublicius is the very first bridge that he built. Okay, so going back, after Ancus Marcius, Ancus Marcius had two sons, and they were growing up, but Ancus Marcius died before they were old enough to attain age and rule. So someone else came to power, 
and that someone else was the first of the three and final Etruscan kings, a guy named Tarquinius Priscus and his wife Tanaquil. The story about them is that they were nobodies in Tuscany, which is the part of Italy where the Etruscans lived, or the ancient name for it was Etruria. And they were actually from this city up far to the northwest called Tarquinia, which is an Etruscan city and gave them their names. So one day they had kind of gotten fed up with being nobodies and Tuscany and decided to seek their fortune in Rome and got on a chariot and were riding into Rome. And along came the bird of Jupiter, which is the eagle. And the eagle took the hat off Darquinius's head. The Etruscans have these really weird conical hats and flew around and then put it back on. And Tarquinius's wife, Tanaquil, was skilled in the art of augury and knew that this was a divine omen, a sign, and said, oh, you are going to be a king someday because Jupiter just crowned you. And so, true to the prophecy, Tarquinius became an official under Ancus Marcius. And then one day, when the two sons of Ancus Marcius, who were not old enough to rule, were gone on a hunting expedition, and Ancus Marcius died, Tarquinius seized the moment and addressed the Roman Senate and said, Hey, I've been in the palace. I know how to rule. You guys need to elect me king. And I will be their caretaker. Ha ha ha. <laughs> he pretty much stayed king for the rest of his life. And the Senate agreed and made him king. So he was the first Etruscan king. And you can see, even though he was an Etruscan, he carried on wars with his own native land. Two of the three wars were with Etruscans. And he subdued several cities and enriched Rome after each war. You can see in yellow are the Etruscan cities here, and Rome would slowly absorb this culture, which had peaked in the 700s and was slowly declining as Rome gained. Well, Tarquinius didn't live too long. Along came the two sons. They grew up and decided they wanted power, and so they knocked him off, and he was gone. Well, <laughs> so his wife Tanaquil, though, was wise. She could tell divine signs, and she knew that there was someone in her court who was the rightful next king, and it wasn't her own two sons, either. You see, Tarquinius and Tanaquil had two sons, but they were not really fit to rule, and someone else was. Well, the story is that during a war, one of Tarquinius's wars, they had received a prisoner exchange, which was common in the ancient world. You would take nobles from the other side as prisoners, and they would grow up in your city, so that if ever that other side broke their treaty, there would be the threat that you might kill their hostages. These people were called hostages. So this royal princess, who was a hostage in the court of Tanaquil, and who was one of the maidens in waiting to Tanaquil, serving her like a domestic servant, the story is, strangely, that she became pregnant by a lar. Now what's a lar? These were the god of your own family. It's kind of like the spirit of your ancestors, but also of you. And you would have a little shrine in your house where you would worship these or burn incense to them and honor them. And so the story is that this slave girl became pregnant by a lar, and the child was clearly divinely blessed himself. This was the child, the next king, Servius Tullius, who showed signs of divine favor throughout his life, like bees flying around him and all kinds of weird stuff. So Tanaquil orchestrated his succession, and she took the body of her dead husband into the palace and said, oh no, he's just sick, he's just injured, and locked the door so that nobody knew what was going on, kind of like how Woodrow Wilson's wife closed down the White House when he died, and the rumor is she was herself signing his laws and using his signature, but nobody knows because she locked it, put the place down and said he's too sick for visitors. And so Tanaquil called in Servius and explained to him the situation, and then she presented him on the balcony to the people, and they all acclaimed, yes, he, 
he would be a great king. And so just by public acclamation, the next king of Rome became this excellent leader, Servius Tullius. Why was he so excellent? Well, he did these things called the Servian reforms. And they were really kind of like an updating of the whole system to make it work better. And it was a double-pronged, two-headed update. One was an update of the army, and the other was an update of kind of the civil ordering of the community, with the census and the taxation. Servius would have all the citizens go out into the campus of Martius and give a record of how much money they had, and depending on how much money they had, they would be assigned their rate of taxation and then assigned to a particular century or group of a 100 in the army. So Servius kind of changed the lawmaking body from the Curiate Assembly, which was basically the noble families, the 30 original Roman Curiae, or tribes, to now making the lawmaking assembly be basically the military men. So that was another serious change. He was, in that way, kind of considered a populist. And 60 centuries were made out of this. So if you do 60 times 100, that's 6,000 men or one legion's worth. And the rich people had to furnish a certain set of armor and weapons. And if you were poor, you had exceptions to that, but you had still had to furnish something, right down to the riffraff who didn't have to do military service at all. But it regularized the system and made Rome's army something to be contended with rather than a ragtag group of warriors. So um, the result of that was Servius started the first really big wars with Vei and the Etruscans and did quite well winning them. One other thing Servius did was he built Rome's first wall. So to this day, if you take the train into Rome to the Termini station, and go to McDonald's inside the Termini station, you can see pieces of this wall there that they've built the station up around. And you can kind of imagine that you are seeing here the same thing that um, Hannibal probably saw huh, from when he came through in 300 BC, but the wall itself was built in 500 BC. So that's something kind of neat to think about. And it's a serious wall. Before that, it would have just been like a stockade. So anyway, Servius had two daughters. And since his patronymic was Tullius in fine Roman tradition, his two daughters were each named Tullia. Tullia the Elder, Tullia Maior, and Tullia the Younger, Tullia Minor. Well, to cement his line and to establish it, Servius Tullius decided to marry them Here's the symbol for marriage, this double ring, interlocked rings, to marry them to the two sons of his predecessor, Tarquinius Priscus, who had two sons, or some say two grandsons. And Tarquinius's two sons were Lucius Tarquinius and a guy named Aaron's Tarquinius. So Servius Tullius thought to himself, well, haha, <laughs> I'm a little worried because I wasn't really appointed by the Senate. So someone could say that I'm not really the rightful king, even though there were all those divine signs. But if I marry my two daughters to the two sons of my predecessor, hey, now my line is pretty well insured. So that's what he did. Well, well, ever heard of a love triangle? That's not a good thing, right? Well, this is even worse. This is a love square. Haha. <laughs> Tulia Mayor and Aaron's had no ambition. And so their two spouses saw this and fell in love and plotted and, yes, knocked off, that is, murdered each of their spouses so that they could get married. Boom, boom. And so now Tulia Minor was the wife now of the next in line to the throne, Tarquinius Superbus. All right, so that's the end of those two people. Wow, what audacity. Huh, but it wouldn't stop there. It was just starting. So next thing that happened was that they weren't willing to wait for their father or father-in-law Servius to die. So Tarquinius Superbus decided that he was just going to seize power. 
The king was getting old. Tarquinius marched down to the Senate house, sat himself upon the royal throne, and called upon the senators to wait upon him as their new king. And lo and behold, I guess who came to defend his right to rule? Along came Servius Tullius. Well, first off, Tarquinius started lambasting him, like saying, oh, he was a bad king, he had no right to rule, he was the son of a slave, he wasn't appointed in the right manner, and so when Servius came into the Senate house, Tarquinius grabbed the old man and hurled him off the steps, and then as the old man was stumbling back home to try to recover from the injury of all that, Tarquinius sent his hitmen after Servius and had him killed. Well, guess who just in the nick of time pulled up to hail her husband as the new king? None other than Tulia. Well, <laughs> Tarquin was a little worried for her that, you know, something might happen to her because things were getting violent. So he sent her home. But on the way home, her chariot encountered the dead body of her father, King Servius, in the street. Story is that she ordered her chariot driver to drive right over him. And when he wouldn't do it, she herself seized the reins and did it. So there's another act of brazen audacity that they undertook, so the story goes. In fact, there are quite a few of them, um, and as we'll see here coming up, things were just started. So Tarquinius seized the throne, um, convinced the senators that, yeah, he was the rightful guy since they were electing him, not the riffraff people. And so, first thing Tarquinius decided to do was to get allies so that he could start waging war. Now, you see here, I have a map of the area, and Rome's in the top left corner up there. But um, near around are the cities of Latium. And Tarquin wanted these as his neighbors most of all, because there's nothing like an enemy in your backyard to stab you in the back. So the first thing he did was to try to get all these cities of Latium on his side. So he called a council of all the leaders and asked them to make treaties with him and to unite their armies. Well, there was one leader who didn't want to because he had heard the awful, brazen, impious, audacious things that this Tarquin had done. And so he tried to convince the others not to go along with this. This guy was named Turnus. Well, Tarquin, as the Machiavellian-style prince that he was, came up with a trick to knock off this guy. So Tarquin bribed his servant to hide swords in Turnus's house, and then lo and behold, Tarquin told all the rest of the rulers that he had caught wind of a plot by Turnus to kill them all, and they broke into Turnus's house, and lo and behold, there were all the swords in the closet. Everyone believed the story, so um, they all agreed to Tarquin's chosen method of execution, which was to put the poor man into a wooden cage, float it in the pool in the local courtyard there, and then throw rocks on top of the cage until the weight drowned the man inside the cage. How nice. What a... What an ingenious method of execution. So most of the Latin towns were totally tricked by the trick against Turnus, and they became allies with Rome, but one town wasn't. Gabii here, just to the east of Rome. So Tarquin came up with another trick to deal with this town. He whipped his son Sextus, who would later do some awful things himself, just like his father, but for the moment, he was cooperating with his father, and so he let himself be whipped and bloodied, and then got sent off to Gabii as if he were seeking refuge. And he told the citizens of Gabi, hey, take me in, and someday you can put me on the throne of Rome, and I'll knock off my father who has driven me out from his house. And all the Gabians believed that, and so they made him one of their chief advisors. And once the son had accumulated a certain amount of power and cemented his position, he 
He sent word back to his father, Tarquinius, what should I do to hand the city over to you? And Tarquinius received Sextus's messengers and listened to Sextus's reported question, and Tarquinius didn't say a word. Well, all he did was took his sword into the garden and started chopping off the heads of the tallest poppies, one after another. Chop, chop, chop. And the messengers didn't really know what was going on, but they told Sextus what their father had done, and Sextus knew what Tarquin was implying, and so Sextus, one by one, started secretly killing off the leading men of the city of Gabii, until there were none left except himself. And in no time at all, himself in power, Sextus sent a message to Tarquin, hey, I'm in charge now, you can come with your army, and they came up to the city, and Sextus threw open the gates and said, we're going to be allies with Rome now because all the chief men have died, we don't know what to do, and we can't survive without making peace with my father. What a fox. So we have all the audacious acts of Tarquin here. So far we've done numbers one through four. A fifth thing that Tarquin did was he reportedly burned six sibyline books. Now, if you remember from the previous video, the Cumaean oracle was a sibylline prophet, the Sibyl, down in Cumae, near Naples or Mount Vesuvius. And she had nine books of prophecies. And one day she showed up in Tarquin's court and said, Hey, Tarquin, I'll give you these nine books of prophecies about Rome if you pay me something outrageously expensive, like six talents of silver or something. I don't know. And Tarquin huh, wasn't a pious guy, and he didn't care about her. And he said, No way! I'm not doing that. So... She burned three of the books right in front of him, so that now there were only six left, not nine. And so she said, hey, I'll give you the remaining six now for, guess what? The same price. Six talents of silver. Huh. Tarquin scratched his head and wondered what she was up to, but no, he still wasn't interested. Of course, I mean, there are less now. So what do you think the human Sybil did? She burned three more. Now there were only three left. And she, again, she offered him these three books for the same price. Six talents of silver. Ha! <laughs> Tarquin suddenly realized that maybe there might be something that he should be buying here. And so, yes, he paid the Sybil her requested price and saved those three books, which thereafter became heavily consulted by the Roman priests and leaders and even emperors ever after that. But uh, two-thirds of them were lost by his impiety. So there you go. Okay, so the last outrageous thing that Tarquin did here, number six here, resulted from his being thrown out of power. And we need to go into how that occurred now. So um, the story is that Tarquin was fighting the Volsci, and, or actually, no, at this time he was just fighting Ardea down here, and he was laying siege to it, which meant that all his army was sitting around idle doing nothing. And the men got to bragging, and one of them bragged that his wife, his wife Lucretia, back in Rome, was the most faithful and dutiful wife there ever was. And no one believed it, but they decided to devise a test to figure out whether this was true or not. And so they went back to Rome, and sure enough, Lucretia was going about her domestic tasks as if everything were the same, while all the other wives were living it up, carousing and drinking in their various parties. Well, huh, the son of the king, Sextus, remember, who had seized Gabi, who was rather corrupt himself, either loved her or just wanted to corrupt her, one of the two. And so the story is that he raped her, and he threatened her. If you tell that I did this, then I'll not only kill you, but I will say that the slave raped you, and that I killed the slave. 
And so in order to be able to warn the others and not just have her own husband's name be slandered, Lucretia submitted and let him rape her and then went to the leaders of Rome and said, this is what the prince ascendant, you know, the next in line to the throne, did to me. And she pulled out a knife and killed herself on the spot. And everyone was so horrified and amazed. And actually, this was regarded as a very virtuous thing to do. Today, we wouldn't want to say that suicide is ever a good thing to do, because we have better morals, basically, nowadays. But back in the pagan world, killing oneself for honor was actually regarded as a very virtuous thing to do. And so, on the spot, one of the leading judges in the city named Junius Brutus. This is the only picture I know of Junius Brutus. Junius Brutus swore an oath that he would expel the kings from the city. And actually, two other guys here swore it with them. They were two other leaders in the city. And so that's what they did. Well, first they convinced the Senate to remove the imperium, or the power of the king. And then they locked the gates and sent word to the army in Ardea, hey, come back home, but don't bring your commander. King's gone. He's out. Now, the Tarquins, since they couldn't get into Rome, had to go back to their hometown of Tarquinia. But as for Sextus... Where do you think he fled to first? Ha ha ha. He fled back to that city where he had been in power, uh, Gabii. Well, when a strong man, a mob boss, which is kind of what the Tarquins were, loses power, do you think their lives are worth as much? I mean, after all, if you no longer have to fear reprisals, and one of these mob bosses comes back to you, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, that's what happened to Sextus. Sextus got back to Gabii. The Gabians remembered what he had done the first time. Now, no longer was there a powerful father threatening to kill them if they knocked him off, and that was the end of Sextus. Boom. He was killed. All right, so now there was just Tarquin and his two or three other sons. And so the rest of the life of Tarquinius was spent warring to try to regain his throne. So a civil war broke out, and here are the two sides. You've got the monarchists on the left versus the republicans on the right. So Tarquinius, just as usual, the first way he tried to regain power was by trickery. And he persuaded the two sons of Lucius Junius Brutus to try to stage a coup and kill their own father and throw out the Republicans. Well, the plot was caught and found out about, and everyone expected that Brutus here would appeal for mercy to his two sons and let them just be exiled. But Brutus was a man of principle, and he said, no, they can't just be exiled. An example needs to be set. And he sent his own lictors out there to have them executed. And that's exactly what happened. They were executed. And here's a picture here you can see of the two bodies of his two sons being brought, brought back. And the women in the family are freaking out, as anyone would. And But Brutus here is totally unfazed, totally focusing on principle and the survival of the state. So Junius Brutus is one of the great heroes of Roman Republicans throughout history. All right, well, the first plot by trickery, or guile, failed. The next plot was to bring Vetii and Tarquinia in on the side of Tarquin. Now, if I zoom out here, you can see the Etruscan cities in yellow and the Latin cities in red. And Tarquinia, where the Tarquins came from, and Vetii were the two closest cities. So this was kind of like a quick solution. Tarquin obviously thought that he could just take the throne back pretty fast, and there wouldn't be much resistance as long as he had an army on his side. So he got the Vetians and the Tarquinians on his side, since he himself was an Etruscan like them. And the Etruscans came and met the Romans in battle, and there was a great battle, and it was really close. Brutus himself here was killed, so he's gone, and 
the Romans barely won. They lost most of their army. There wasn't much left. And so it looked pretty bad for Rome holding on to or conquering anyone in the future. Well, Tarquinius knew just what to do. He went to, guess who, the next Etruscan power broker up here, who was the king of Clusium, named Lars Porcina. And Clusium at this time ruled quite a few Etruscan cities, so it had a massive, huge army. And the massive army of Lars Porcina came marching down here to Rome and encamped on the west bank of the Tiber out here in present-day Trastevere, or across the Tiber. And if you remember, there was only one bridge here across the Tiber at this time. And the story is that the Romans survived, not by an army, because they didn't have one left, really, but by virtue. And the first thing that happened was there was a man named Horatius, who single-handedly held off the entire Etruscan army on the narrow bridge while his friends unbuilt the bridge behind him. And you can see that picture here of them frantically unbuilding the bridge while Tarquin holds off the Etruscans. And here's the goddess Roma crowning him with victory. And so the story was that once the bridge was unbuilt, Tarquin uttered a prayer to the god of the Tiber that he might survive and jumped into the Tiber in full armor and miraculously was delivered to the Roman bank um, as a great hero. So, huh. Lars Porcino was impressed by this. Next up, something else happened to impress Lars Porcino. Remember hostages, the practice of giving hostages to the other side? Well, one of the Roman girls was a girl named Cloelia, who was a hostage in the Etruscan camp out there on the west bank of the Tiber. So she convinced her other female hostages to swim across the huge Tiber which was much bigger then than it is even today. And that's what they did. They had enough stamina and strength to swim across the whole Tiber in the night without anyone finding out. Well, when Lars Porcina found out what had happened, in the name of honor, he requested the Romans to send his hostages back. And surprisingly, the Romans did. They sent Cloyley and the girls back. And Lars Porcino was so impressed with this that he was on the verge of making friends with Rome rather than conquering them. Then the last straw for Lars Porcino was that during the night, one of the young men of Rome snuck into camp to try to assassinate him. And instead of assassinating Lars, the king, the man mistook Lars for his secretary and killed his secretary. Well, <laughs> quickly the man was captured, was arrested by the guards and dragged in front of Lars Porcina. And they said, what are you doing? And the man, whose name was Gaius Mucius here, lied and said, I'm just one of a hundred of us youths, and there are 99 more of us coming to assassinate you after me. And look at the sign of our fidelity. And what he did was he put his hand into the flame there and without even flinching, burned off his thumb. And Lars was so impressed with this and so unimpressed with the lack of virtue of the man he was fighting for, Tarquinius Superbus, that he packed up and went home and actually made friends with the Romans instead of putting his Etruscan buddy on their throne. In fact, and this lasted for quite a few years, the Romans survived this round two of the wars because of their virtue, even though they pretty much had no army left. Well, Tarquinius was not yet to be stopped. He would fight to his death. And so the next thing he did was he got all the Latins on his side. Remember how he had drowned Turnus and convinced, tricked all the other Latins to thinking that he was on their side? Well, he got an army out of them. And they met the Romans about a decade, I think, later, if I remember correctly, but years later, at a great battle at Lake Regillus, here near Gabes. The lake isn't here anymore, it's dried up. 
But enough of the Roman youths had grown up by this point that Rome had a bit of an army. It still wasn't enough to match the Latins. Well, it was pretty close. But the story is that in the middle of the battle, in an incredible omen, the two youths, Castor and Pollux, were seen fighting for the Roman side and striking terror into the hearts of the Latin army. Just these huge apparitions. By the way, Castor and Pollux are equivalent to pretty much saints, because they were born human. Well, one was half divine, but um, and were deified, went to heaven, and became the constellation Gemini, because they were twins. Gemini means twins. Okay, so many of the leaders on both sides were killed. Pretty much both armies on each side was decimated so that there were few soldiers left, but all that mattered was that the Romans survived, so that was the end of the cause of the Tarquins. Tarquinius only lived a few more years. He was gone. He fled south to the Greeks in southern Italy, and the Republic of Rome survived.